In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Brandyn asks us, how do other primates deal with the umbilical cord and placenta when the baby is born, when they don't have any sort of medical help to make sure everything's handled right? Other than certain modern humans, some marine mammals like whales and dolphins, chimpanzees and a few domesticated animals, mammal mothers typically eat the afterbirth. While most humans have all that mess dealt with in hospital, cetaceans enjoy a rather explosive expulsion of the placental into seawater. On the other hand, chimpanzee mothers are said to ignore the matter entirely and simply haul around baby, placenta, and cord until the latter dries up and drops off, usually in about a day. For most of the rest, however, the mothers eat not only the placenta and the cord, but they tend to ingest a fair bit of amniotic fluid as well while cleaning the affected areas. Researchers have several hypotheses to explain placentophagia, and these include hygiene, to reduce odors that may attract predators, to replenish nutrients lost during pregnancy and also to acquire additional hormones. Another hypothesis for the practice is that by gobbling up the afterbirth, the mother will naturally come into contact with her young, and by licking them clean, this contact will stimulate bonding and caretaking behaviors. Neuroscientists have other hypotheses, and these include that ingestion of the afterbirth, and in particular the amniotic fluid, may enhance naturally occurring pregnancy-induced analgesia. They propose that since amniotic fluid appears before any fetus pops out by cleaning it off through ingestion, the mother may also be ingesting a substance that boosts her brain's ability to produce natural painkillers. Similarly, there is some evidence to support the idea that in the same way afterbirth boosts androgynous opioid production to alleviate pain, those additional opioids may also stimulate maternal behaviors. Given all these potential benefits for animals, and how relatively common it is amongst our mammalian compatriots, it has led some to wonder if placentophagia might well be beneficial for human mothers as well, and if it ever was a common practice among humans. As for the latter question, a thorough review of anthropological literature was conducted in 2010 and did not find a single example of afterbirth eating as a common custom in any documented culture, although some still speculate that in the past it must have been practiced widely at some point in human history, and there are certainly known anecdotal instances, particularly in more relatively recent times. On that note, in ultra-modern times, this practice has become a thing among some, and increasingly new mothers are saving their placentas and ingesting them later. This all makes us ponder whether this actually counts as a form of cannibalism, which is defined as the practice of eating the flesh of one's own species. And speaking of birth-related things, if you search around enough, you'll inevitably find many a mildly humorous heated argument over whether swallowing human sperm counts as cannibalism, as it's technically flesh of a sort. Going back to placentas, adherents claim all manner of benefits with consumption of the organ, including increased strength, relief from postpartum depression and mood swings, improving lactation, and accelerating the mother's recovery. The most common way to ingest the placenta today is in capsule form. Termed a traditional Chinese method to make placenta pills, first the organ is steamed in some recipes with ginger, hot pepper, and lemon. Then it is chopped, dehydrated, ground into powder, and placed in capsules. Placenta can also be made into a tincture, cooked like other meats, or just eaten raw in a blended smoothie. Of course, the pills seem to be the most popular option. So, does it really work? Despite its increasing popularity, there remains little in the way of any specific evidence to support adherence claims, and unfortunately, there hasn't been a single double-blind study as of the writing of this script that tests the afterbirth pill's effectiveness. Another emerging placental trend is to leave the umbilical cord attached to the newborn until it falls off on its own, which could occur within 10 days. Called a lotus birth, proponents claim that it fosters bonding and has health benefits for the baby. One mother who chose such a birth in 2013 noted that since the placenta didn't release for several hours after birth, she and the baby enjoyed a prolonged bonding period. In her account, over the next few days, the placenta was given a daily bath and kept in a waterproof bag. Her baby, Ulysses, and the placenta went everywhere together, and at night Ulysses slept with his parents on the bed, with the placenta placed to one side. After six days, like his famous namesake, young Ulysses had apparently had enough and finally took matters into his own hands. When his parents woke up, they found their brave baby grasping the severed cord, which he had yanked off by himself. And now for a bonus fact. 
Speaking of animal births, it turns out, unlike so many other animals, in seahorses, the female impregnates the male, who will later go on to give birth. As for the specifics, the reproductive process of a seahorse begins when a male and female meet up and dance. For several days prior to the actual act of mating, the two fish – yes, they are fish – will meet to intertwine their tails and swim together. They also sometimes grip the same strand of seagrass with their tails and whirl it around in unison. Scientists believe this courtship and dancing synchronizes the movements of the two fish to prepare the male to receive the eggs at the same time that the female is ready to deposit them. After several days of this, the male blows water through an egg pouch on his stomach. The water flow expands and opens the pouch to demonstrate to the female that it is empty and ready for her to insert her oviposteor, an organ that is used to lay eggs. At that point, the two swim in a sort of snout-to-snout -snout embrace, spiraling upward through the water, trying to line up so the female can insert her ovipositor into the male's pouch. She does this several times, resting between to avoid becoming exhausted. As the eggs leave the female body, she slims down. As the male receives the eggs, he plumps up. The process can last up to eight hours. In the end, she deposits anywhere from a few dozen to a few thousand eggs into the male's pouch, depending on the species of seahorse. When it's done, the female does not stay to cuddle, but simply swims away and finds a nice place to rest, while her other posterior contracts, which can take a couple of hours. After his lady friend is gone, the male attaches himself to a nearby plant and is left to finish the job by himself, releasing sperm directly into the water around him to fertilize the eggs, which are now embedded in the wall of his pouch. The pouch provides oxygen and prolactin to nurture the eggs. While the female chose to leave right after the mating, she's at least nice enough to drop by and check up on her pregnant partner. During the gestation period, anywhere from two to four weeks, the female visits the male on a daily basis, though not for long. The two simply interacting for a few minutes each each time swimming together, much like they did during courtship. In the minutes immediately preceding birth, his muscles contort, bending him backwards and forward repeatedly for about 10 minutes until all the babies, known as fry, explode out of the pouch. There can be as few as 8 and as many as 200 seahorse fry born at a single time. Amazingly, the male's pouch returns to its normal size and position in only about an hour, and he is ready to mate again within a few hours, and sometimes he even does. The male seahorse may give birth, but as with many fish, he does not stick around to nurture the young, but leaves them on their own. In the end, around five infant seahorses in every 1,000 survive into adulthood. Many are eaten by predators or die of starvation when ocean currents push them too far away from food sources. Even so, by fish standards, five out of a thousand is actually a pretty good rate thanks to the father pouch protecting the little ones for a time, while other fish often just lay eggs and immediately abandon them after fertilization. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I do called Highlight History? I'm linking to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.